waiting for you to get the questions in for tonight's uh, lesson. Uh, here are some questions that have been uh, uh, turned in. Uh, here's one written by a young, younger person. Was Jesus born in the year zero? Uh, I don't know if you've ever thought about that or not, but you know, there is B.C. What does that mean? Well, that means before Christ. Well, uh, one year before Christ, what was the date? What do you call the year of that it was born? How many years B.C. is that? Now, I remember as a child hearing A.D., and did not know it was a Latin word. I thought it meant after the death. I lost 30 years of, of history when I was growing up, before, the years before Christ and the years after his death. A.D. does not mean after his death. A.D. means in the year of our Lord, in the year of the Lord. And so until Jesus was born, it was B.C., it was one day B.C., it was one week B.C., it was, uh, uh, it was uh, you know, one year B.C., uh, it was 10 B.C., 10 years before Christ. And then Christ was born, and He was born, and in the first year of His life, in the first year of the Lord, in the first week of the Lord, in the first day of the Lord, that would be the next year. So there's B.C., down you get to zero, or to 1 B.C., and then there is no year zero because the very next year after 1 B.C. is the year of the Lord. Interesting question, and uh, uh, that, that's uh, interesting. I don't know what young person turned that one in, but uh, it, it, is, it, is, it is really good. Here's an interesting one, and that is, does God hate the devil? Is there any scripture reference to this? Well, it depends on what you mean, is there any scripture reference to it? The, the word hate is a, is a word that uh, carries all kinds of meanings in relationship to it. Uh, David said, uh, Psalm 119, um, it's, it's the last verse, one of those sections over there. Uh, David, I'll get, get it in just a minute. Psalm 119, verse 104. Therefore, you, through your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. Well, does God hate that which is evil? Yes. What about the anger of the Lord? Does not the psalmist say, the Lord is angry with the wicked every day? Now, sometimes we take the word hate and we equate it with the word anger, and that may not be the best way, best way to do it. Does God hate sin? Well, yes. Uh, and in that sense, there is hate in relationship to God. Here is the response that we need to understand that God has to evil. Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 13 says, God, you are of eyes too pure to behold iniquity. And so if we're talking about an evil man or the evil, the evil devil, the, the principle is exactly the same thing. And that principle is the principle that the uh, Lord has eyes too pure to behold evil and therefore he just cannot look at it. And isn't that what Genesis 6 is all about? When the Lord looked down and saw that every thought and imagination was on evil continually, that when Jesus looked, or when the Lord looked down and saw every bit of that, that there was that uh, attitude of God, of a holy God that says, I, it repents me that I have made man to dwell on the face of this earth. And so uh, uh, God does hate the devil in that sense. Is there a verse that says that God hates the devil? I'm not sure of one that specifically uses the word hate in relationship to that, but that is God's attitude toward the devil. Here's one. How does God feel about us when we lose heart and faith and don't feel like being faithful, but remain faithful in body, but not in spirit? Uh, and, and we don't sin. Uh, how does God feel about us? Well, let me, let me think about, let, let, let me point you to Luke chapter 15. In Luke chapter 15, there were those individuals and they were those tax collectors and uh, the, the, uh, the affirmation that was made whenever Jesus received tax collectors. And that's the context of what I'm about to look at. Here Jesus is, God with us, and he's dealing with people that are doing wrong. And the, and the, the Pharisees and scribes complain, says, this man receives sinners and eats with them. And so in a series of about three or four stories, Jesus develops the attitude that says that when something precious has been lost, even men rejoice whenever it is found. And so he uses these illustrations to answer that. Now, what's he talking about? 
He's not just talking about the fact that we rejoice when we find something that has been lost. He, he says, and in the context, you are criticizing me for loving those who are doing wrong. And you yourself need to know the joy there is whenever there is that which has been lost has restored to you. And so it, it's a series of stories dealing with the fact that Jesus loves those who are lost. And there are three stories here. One is the story of, of the shepherd who has a hundred sheep and he loses one of the sheep. And whenever he goes and finds it, he comes home, Luke chapter 15, verse 6, calls his friends together saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. What's he talking about? He's talking about the fact you're criticizing me for loving sinners and being concerned about them, but in practice, even that shepherd has greater concern for the lost sheep than he does for the sheep that has been found. He then, in verse 8, talks about a woman who has ten coins and she loses one of them. And he says, does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and searches carefully until she finds it? And when she found it, and when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together saying, rejoice with me. I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there will be joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repents. Now then, he, he, he has dealt with the fact that a woman has lost coins, but he's not talking about coins and the joy of finding uh, a lost coin. He's talking about the joy there is in heaven when somebody does right. Could I point out to you to look carefully in verse 10 that says, there's joy in the presence of the angels. Did you see that? Do you see any significance in the fact that he does not say that the angels in heaven rejoice? He does not say the angels in heaven rejoice. Now they do. There are other ways to show that, but that's not what this verse is. It says in the presence of angels, there is joy when one sinner repents. Isn't that remarkable? When one sinner repents. Now who is in the presence of angels? Angels are not in the presence of angels when you put a collective group. Here are all of the angels. And in the presence of all of the angels, there is joy. Wonder who is in the presence of the angels. That's God himself. So we're not talking about coins, though that's the illustration. We're talking about the fact that there is joy in heaven whenever one sinner repents. And then... He says and uses this illustration of a son that was lost. And while he does not draw the same conclusion at the end by saying there is joy in the presence of angels, by implication there is. The story illustrates the very thing he's discussing. The discussion in Luke 15 is Jesus loving sinners. And so he says a lost sheep causes a shepherd to rejoice. A lost coin causes a woman to rejoice. And then the conclusion is, whenever he says, there's joy in the presence of angels whenever sinners reveal. And then he uses a, one of the most touching stories in, the, in all of literature. And that is the story of the lost boy. And whenever that son came, came home, the father saw, uh, uh, well, let's see, uh, uh, he, he says to, to the son, let me get, get to the verse. verse. Verse 18, beginning. I will arise and go to my father. That's what the son says. Father, I've sinned against heaven. I'm no longer worthy to be called Jesus. And he arose and came to the father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion on him and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. What's he trying to illustrate? He's trying to illustrate that Jesus loves sinners and it's right for us to love sinners. Now I recognize that the question that, he's turned, that has been turned in talks about the, not the fact that I've gone out and I've left the Lord, but I'm only here in body. And I love, uh, love that concept that says uh, 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 I'm not always in spirit uh, and, and I don't, I'm, I'm not, I've not left the Lord. Well, how does God feel about that individual? 
Can, can, can we use this story about the prodigal son? How, how would, would a father feel? How would a, a mother feel when there is a, there's that son or that daughter who in spite of the fact they don't really feel like doing with great joy and great love in serving God, how would that father feel when that son or that daughter still tries to do the right thing? Is that a parallel? You stop and think about it. There are times whenever you love your husband, not because of an emotion that you have, not because your spirit might be involved in that, but you love your husband because it's the right thing to do. And we've got to understand that. That not every motivation in serving God comes out of a motivation that is that, is, that, that, is that warm, fuzzy feeling in relationship to it. That's why that Greek word we've talked about, the word agape, is not a word that primarily has to do with emotions. It has to do with actions. Has to do with actions. And so there is that motivation to serve God. We love Him because He first loved us. There is that aspect of us that is in and of itself emotional as we, as we sing, Oh, how I love Jesus, or, or some song like that. There are those emotional expressions that are there. But you and I need to understand that sometimes agape love, whether it's for a, a son and daughter being obedient and, and uh, honoring parents in that way, or a wife serving her husband, or a husband serving his wife, not because, well, it just, it just makes me so happy to be able to do this. No, I want you to know that I love you. I, my, my spirit may not, may not be here in its entirety, but I'm still going to try to do that which is right. I believe that's the, the attitude that the individual has when he asks the question, how does God feel about that? Here is this prodigal son. How happy do you think he was coming back home? How much joy did he have when he came back home? You stop and think about it. Did you ever get a bad report card? No, I'm sure you didn't. But you remember, you remember, I've got to go home and show mom and dad that this is not a, 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 a honor roll. It's not the A and B honor roll. And I don't know, you know, uh, kids, I, I hate they put numbers in to illustrate your grades. I don't know if they still do, but there's a way to change an F into an A if you're really going to get into trouble. Just put another line down on the right-hand side over there. Don't you dare do that. But there's a way that that can be, not that I ever did it. But, but you've got this report card, and you've got to face your parents. Why do you do it? Because it's the right thing to do. And here is this child that's got a report card that he is ashamed of and he comes and he gives that report card to his parents. How does that parent feel about that child whose heart is there because, because it's the right thing to do? We are wrong in thinking that Christianity involves one always being on a spiritual high. Maybe I can illustrate uh, an attitude that, that uh, is parallel to what we're talking about. I believe it is in Psalm 73, where in verse 1, David says, Truly God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. God's good to those that love Him. But look at the next verse. Here's a man after God's own heart. As for me... My feet almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. David, where are you right now? Have you just killed Goliath and now you're there and God has just used you in some mighty way to win a great, great battle? David, have you defeated the Philistine and put their entire army to flight? Those are mountaintops experience. They're the spiritual high. But here's David. And he says, I looked at how the wicked were prospering. And I just about quit. You want to put that at incidences in David's life? You want to stop and think about the fact that, uh, that uh, 
Here's David and his own son has rebelled against him. And his own son is seeking to kill him. David's trying to live right. David's trying to do right. And his own son's. What about King Saul? What about David's this experience after he'd killed Goliath? And now shortly thereafter, King Saul is not just trying to send out a few individuals to kill David. He's got his entire army chasing David. David, are you on a spiritual high? Where's your spirit at a time like that? I was almost ready to quit. Now, isn't that the attitude that is expressed in this question? How does God feel about us when we lose heart and faith and don't feel like uh, being faithful but remain faithful in body but not in spirit? Isn't that, isn't that remarkable? David had that. Now, can we look at the rest of this verse? David does not just leave us in that when he says, in, he says in verse 4, When I look at the wicked, there are no pains in their death. In death, their strength is firm. They're not in trouble as other men. Who's the other men here? That's the righteous. Here's the wicked, and they don't have the trouble sometimes that righteous folks have. Nor are they plagued like other men, the righteous men. Therefore pride serves as their necklace, and violence covers them like garments. Their eyes bulge with abundance. They have more than, than the heart could wish. They scoff and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouths against the heaven, and their tongues walk through the earth. Therefore his people return here, and the waters of a full cup are drained by them. And they say, how does God know? Is there any knowledge of the Most High? They are ungodly. Those who are always at ease, they increase in riches. Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain. I look at them and they, I've got, they've got it so easy and I've got it so hard. And he, and he says, you know, I've cleansed my heart in vain. And then he says, if I had, uh, verse 15, if I had said I will speak thus, well, look, verse 14, all day long I've been plagued and chastened every morning. I have said I will speak thus, Behold, I would have been untrue to the generation of your children. When I thought of, of how to understand this, it was too painful for me to understand. Too painful for me until, and underline this, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood. Then I understood. And so here's David, not living on a mountaintop, his spirit struggling, but that doesn't stop him from doing right. And guess where he went? To the sanctuary of God. And so here's that individual that says, I, I'm faithful in body. I'm still coming to worship God, but I'm really, really, you know, how does God feel about that? Sort of like that prodigal walking back home with an F on his, on, on his report card. And he's got that speech ready to give to God. I don't know if you ever had to rehearse a speech you had to make to your mom and dad to try to explain why, why uh, you did what you did and he's got his whole spill ready to give to them and he doesn't give it all. He do, he's not able to finish it all until his father almost interrupts him and says, kill the fatted calf. Who's this individual? Put yourself in his place. He's a young man who's, who's wasted all of the treasures his father's given them. He's a young man who has shamed the family name. He's a young man who's been involved in immorality and ungodliness. Where's his spirit when he comes back home? Broken spirit. How does God feel about him? Well, the story Jesus gives is to answer the question, how does God feel towards sinners? It doesn't mean that we ought to... Uh, 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 do, oh, it does not mean that we ought to uh, uh, go out and live sinful or anything like that, but it does mean that God loves us when we're bad, and that's the good part of that. Here's another question. I've heard that uh, yes, I, I've got the question. I've heard that there are no church records or prophets uh, admonition, 400 B.C., some 400 years. Uh, why is there no record or scriptures? Why is this true? 
And the answer is yes. You look at the end of Malachi, and when you get to the end of Malachi, the people of God have come back from Babylonian captivity. The exact date of Malachi is, is, not, is not known specifically. Somewhere between 400 and 500 B.C. You remember the date when they came back from Babylonian captivity? That was 536 B.C., whenever they came back from Babylonian captivity. And now they're back. Zerubbabel has brought them back. Later Ezra and, and, uh, uh, and Nehemiah are back, and they're reestablishing the worship of God. Some individuals want to add another 70 years to that uh, to, the, to get to the time of the, of the period of Nehemiah. But somewhere in that period of time after they came back from Babylonian captivity. And so you take about 70 years from uh, uh, 538 B.C. Somebody will have to help me with the math. Is that 466 B.C.? Something like that. Uh, you, you look at the, that, that's when the, these prophets are here. And then you get to the end of the Old Testament and there is no prophet. How do we know? Well, those individuals who received the writings of Moses and knew they were from Moses and thereby knew they were from God. They're the ones who authenticate that Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and uh, ought to be in the, in, in the Bible. Those who received those books knew who wrote them. In the scripture that was read tonight, David says, this is the, these are the last words of David. The Spirit spake by me, and His words were in my tongue. I want you to hear that. And then the very next verse, the, the, the God of heaven has said to the king, said to me, and then David writes down the words of the Spirit of God. He writes down the words of God. David, what did God say to the king? This is 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 3. What did the God say to the king? David said, this is what he said. We know what God said to the king. And we know the accuracy of it because his, his Spirit, the Spirit spake by me. And so when it comes to the matter of those Old Testament scriptures, just as Moses brought the words in the plural, the words of God down on tables of stones and handed them to the people, so the Holy Spirit gave the words of God, not on a mountaintop, but through the prophets. Now those who receive the words of God and recognize that these men were truly prophets of God, rejected the writings after Malachi as being inspired writings. You may be aware of the fact that the Catholic Bible has some books in the Bible that's not found in the Bible that you and I read. Uh, it was in 1500 A.D., or maybe it's 1300 A.D., the Council of Ravenna. It, it, it was uh, uh, at least 1300 years after Jesus was born, and the Jews never accepted any of those Old Testament books that are in the Catholic Bible. They knew they existed, but they rejected them. And it took the Catholics all that long to uh, finally say, these books themselves ought to be in the Bible. Now somebody says, well, should they or should they not? What if they should be there? Well, even if they should be there, they're a part of a covenant God made with some people, not us. Covenant made with the Jewish people, not a covenant made with all mankind. And the Lord came and removed that covenant. So even if the Catholic Church were right, and there's all kinds of evidence that they're not, for the Jews themselves never recognizes, recognize those books as being inspired like the other books of the Old Testament are inspired. But even if they are, they have nothing at all to do with our eternal salvation. Now the nature of the things that's uh, in, in those books in of themselves are very fascinating. There is an addition, several chapters added uh, to the life of, da of Daniel. And uh, 
you, you, you may, uh, may not be aware of what Daniel did. But uh, uh, Daniel was, was remarkable in that there was a dragon. You listening? There was a dragon over there in Babylon. And this dragon was wreaking havoc on the people that were there. And in one of those books, in, that, in those books that uh, even the Jews did not recognize as being inspired, Daniel mix up, mixes up a concoction of material, and I believe one of the elements in there was tar, and he fed that to the dragon. And the dragon ate it and exploded. Does that sound like the miracles of the Bible? Think of how foreign that is by its very nature. And no wonder the Jews, whenever they, whenever they uh, read that book that was purported to be, after it had been written sometimes later, purported to be a lost book of the Bible, and, and the Jews themselves said, that's not biblical. Now the question is, why are there no prophets? There's history, and some of those books are, are historical books that tell the things that are happening there in that intertestamental period between the end of Malachi and the beginning of Matthew. Some of those books are historical in nature, and so they give great insight. I'll tell you what even gives greater insight to what was happening, and that is Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 8 and Daniel chapter 11 give historical events hundreds of years before they ever came about. You want to know what happened during those intertestamental period? Read Daniel 7 and Daniel 8 and, uh, and, and Daniel 11. You'll be able to read God's prophecy about the things that were happening there in relationship to that. But why, when you get to the end of Malachi, are there no more prophets? Uh, just stop and think about it. God beginning... Uh, not with, uh, uh, you know, Cain and, well, not, not, not with that. Uh, uh, God has not spoken from Mount Sinai throughout all the ages, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Do you know why God stopped talking? There's an obvious answer. He'd said everything he needed to say. He said everything he needed to say. Sort of like that redneck in Alabama was sitting on the swing with his sweetheart. They'd been dating for some time. And he said, honey, will you marry me? And she said, yes. And then for the next five minutes, not a word was said. said. And finally she said, honey, aren't you going to say anything else? He says, I think I've said too much already. <laughs> God had a revelation to give. And when God got to the end of that revelation, there's, no, there's nothing more to be said. Now you stop and think about it. When you get to the end of the New Testament, there are no prophets after the end of the New Testament. Why? Because God has said everything that He needs to say. And so when you get to the end of the New Testament, there are verses like 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3 that says God has given unto us everything that pertains to life and godliness. Already has done it. Uh, all the, the, the scriptures, 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 and 17, the scriptures thoroughly supply the man of God and every good work. When you get to the end of the New Testament, is the life and the spiritual knowledge that a Christian needs to live and to serve God, is there any need for there to be ongoing prophets? No. Because, why? Because God has thoroughly supplied the man of God unto every good work, and God has given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. Why are there no prophets after that? God says... I've already said everything I need to say, and I've given you everything you need. Now you take that principle and apply it to the end of Malachi. When you get to the end of the book of Malachi and arrive at that, at that point, God had thoroughly supplied the Jews with everything they needed until Jesus came. 
That's why there are those 400 silent years that are there. Here's one other question. We'll stop after this one. It's rather, it can be rather involved. We'll try not to make it uh, that involved. Why do people always use the excuse, once saved, you're always saved? Well, there are verses in the Bible that seemingly say that, and we had a question about that perhaps uh, the, last, the, the last time we had a, a Sunday night uh, question and answer period like, we, like we're having tonight. Does the Bible teach once saved, always saved. On Monday night here at the building, we're having a, a real in-depth study that you're certainly invited to and just come once. You don't have to come again if you don't want to, but it's, I believe it's a really an enjoyable study. And we're slowly getting through the book of Hebrews. Uh, two weeks ago, we covered one verse in one night. And uh, so we're not in any rush to finish it and trying to go deep within it. How many verses are there in Hebrews? that talk about being faithful to God. Look in Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4 says that uh, uh, verse, verse, um, verse 11. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 11. Therefore let us be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of unbelief. What's he talking about? He's talking about, to use the language of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, those people who were baptized into Moses, just like Romans chapter 6 says, we're baptized into Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 1 says, they were in Egypt and now they are in Moses. They have escaped the bondage of Egypt, and now they are in Moses. Now, what happened to those individuals? He says they were baptized in the cloud and in the sea. They ate spiritual food. They drank the water that was given to them, and that water was Christ. That rock that gave that water to them was Christ. But God was not pleased with them. And so... He, he destroyed them in the wilderness. And so verse, uh, when you get, get, get to verse 11, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11 says, these things are written for our learning. These examples are there that we might learn from that example. And verse 13, he says, therefore let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Can a child of God fall? Look at what the verse says in Hebrews. Be diligent to enter into that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. Why on earth is there an admonition not to fall away if you never could do it? There's a description in chapter 6 that we'll get to sometime in that Monday night class that is interesting in and of itself. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 4 Look how far away an individual can fall once they're saved. He says, verse 4, It is impossible for those who were once enlightened, those who have tasted the heavenly gift, those who have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they shall fall away, it is is impossible to renew them again to repentance. Isn't that remarkable? A person can leave the Lord and get so hardened away from the Lord, it's impossible to renew them to repentance. It doesn't say, once saved, always saved. And sometimes when you show, show this to individuals, about people in their life or people that they've known. Well, I thought they were saved, but they fell away. Therefore, they never weren't, were saved because once you are saved, you cannot fall away. Are these people in Hebrews chapter 6 saved? Look at the words. Verse 4, they are enlightened. They've tasted the heavenly gift. They are partakers of the Holy Spirit of God. Are they Christians? Absolutely. If they fall away, they can arrive, unto, arrive at the point that it's impossible to bring them back. Why? Look at the rest of verse 6 that says, 
they crucify again to themselves the, 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 the Son of God and put Him to an open shame. What led them to become Christians? What led them to, to become children of God and to turn away from iniquity? What brought, why did that happen? The story of the cross the story of the cross. And if I get so hardened against God, the story of the cross means nothing to me. That shows that that can happen. Look in chapter 10, verse 28 beginning, or verse, yes, verse 28, I guess, maybe 27, David. Verse 26. If we sin willfully... If we are willfully sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. What, what, what remains? A certain fearful expectation of judgment and, indign and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversary. Anyone who despised Moses' law died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Well, what about us? Not under Moses, but under, uh, but under Christ. We're not in Moses, we're in Christ. If they died without mercy, how much sore punishment do you be suppose will he be thought worthy of who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? If I trod underfoot, the blood of Jesus. God has no other story that will ever bring me back. And that's why we must never arrive at the point when we're doing wrong and we let it dwell in our lives if we are sinning willfully. Every sin that you commit is a sin of your will. It's not talking about the fact, well, if you know you're doing wrong and you do it, then there's no hope for you. But if you are living a life knowing that you're wrong, look where you are. You have rejected the only sacrifice there is. You have trodden underfoot the blood of Jesus. And then look at verse 36, when he, 36 through 39. You have need of endurance so that after you have done the will of God, you may, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. If anyone draws back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Watch this. He says, you be faithful. You don't give up. You live, keep living by faith. We are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who keep on believing to the saving of their soul. I know how comforting the doctrine is that says once saved, always saved, but it's not biblical. It's not biblical. There's just too many verses in the Bible that says, don't you give up, don't you give up. If you draw back, if you stop living a life of faith, you're drawing back unto perdition. The wrath of God will come against you it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a living God. I know individuals do that. And we have in times past looked at some of the verses they use to discuss that. But you and I need to recognize that the doctrine once saved, always saved is not true. One quick story. In a religious debate, which I attended so many times when I was the age of some of you here today, loved going to religious debates. This one I was not at. But a man who was, say, who was teaching the doctrine, once saved, always saved, the gospel preacher in the debate went over and looked him in the face, face and, and wrote out a question and Henry said, handed a question, I want you to answer this question. Can a Christian get drunk? Well, the man knew that he was in a dilemma because the Bible says no drunkard can enter into the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, to, uh, verse 9 through 11 a drunkard cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Can a Christian get drunk? And so the man 
thinking he would save himself and say, well, it may be that he could get drunk, but God would not let him die drunk. And the gospel preacher, when it was his turn to speak again, says, you have just given us the secret to eternal life. Become a Christian, get drunk, and don't ever sober up, and you'll live forever and ever and ever. What I've done when I've talked to people who sincerely believe once saved, always saved. And many individuals do. The largest denomination, Protestant denomination in the, in the South teaches the doctrine, once saved, always saved. What I have said to them several times is, to, to people, not necessarily those who are in the debating aspect of that or those reverends who sometimes proclaim that, but just to say to them, have you ever known anybody in your church that you thought was saved and fell away? And I've never had a one of them to say, I've never known that to happen. Why? Because the story of the history of mankind is of people who are with God falling away from God. You want to begin in Genesis chapter 2 with the Garden of Eden and get to Genesis chapter 6, people who knew God but who fell away from knowing God. How wonderful it is, though, that when we do wrong, the Lord will receive us back that father of that prodigal son perhaps shows the kind of love that, that, uh, that uh, uh, is exemplary of the way God feels about us. We feel dirty and unworthy, and the prodigal son saw the father come running out to him. That's the kind of father that you and I serve. He wants us to live right, wants us to do right. But if there's sin in our life, we need to do something about it. And God help us that we may be able to do the things that will glorify God in our lives. He'll forgive you of your wrong if you'll believe in Him, repent of your sins, and be baptized into Christ. Then you're in that place where every spiritual blessing is found. Stay in there. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10 says, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Does that not even of itself show that if you're not faithful, there's no promise of the crown of life? We need to be a Christian tonight. You need to be a faithful Christian. If this church can help you in any way, go to heaven. Won't you let it be known by coming to the front as together we stand and sing. Will you come?